Hi, my name is Gina Clark and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the Fintech Times and today we'll be talking about digital trust. Right now I'm joined by Kevin Lee, Trust and Safety Architect at SIFT, who helps customers implement strategies that cross functionality align risk and revenue programs. Prior to SIFT, he spent the last 14 years leading various risk, chargeback, spam, scams and trust and safety organisations at Facebook, Square and Google. So Kevin, thank you for joining me. Hello, great to be here. And I believe that SIFT has just released its Q1 2021 Trust and Safety Index, is that right? Yes, we just did it just a few weeks ago. Excellent. And I guess based off your findings, how would you say the fraud landscape looked prior to 2020? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, and I'll reference some of this stuff as we talk. I'll, I'll share my screen quickly as well to make it hopefully a little bit easier. <laughs> Great. All right. All right. So um, this is one of the kind of diagrams that we kind of look over in the index report. What we're essentially looking at is the fraud economy. And it is a really well-connected ecosystem that when we were preparing for the report and we sat down kind of on a, on a whiteboard looking at, okay, what are all the different types of fraud and abuse that companies need to deal with? And what we came up with was pretty surprising in terms of just the sheer number and size and scale of these, these attack vectors. If I were to rewind the clock, let's say five years, predominantly from an e-commerce or FinTech space, we are in this payment fraud area where you might have to deal with some, maybe some money laundering, people are using stolen credit cards, uh, and roughly that's it. Uh, but as the internet has grown up, as consumers, legitimate ones, have started to put more and more of their identities online and their behaviors online, certainly this past year with COVID, pushed a whole bunch of new users into this space. And a lot of companies have had to go through that digital transformation as well to kind of keep up and survive. A whole bunch of other new attack vectors have surfaced, whether it's account takeover related um, and also content abuse related. So for account takeover, I mean, think about your loyalty um, accounts or I often reference folks when it comes to how many apps you have on your phone and think about, you may only use let's say 10 apps a day um, based on your typical usage, but you probably have, I'm guessing, over 100 apps installed on your phone. And how many of those apps require or have the option, at least, of a username and password? Probably the vast majority of them. Uh, and we also know that, unfortunately, roughly two-thirds of users share the same credentials across multiple sites. And what that means is that if one particular company gets compromised, that may hold the keys to a whole bunch of other sites that... Um, can do a great job at protecting their system. Um, but it, in this case, the consumers could be the weakest link. And so from an account, take, account takeover perspective, that's one area. And the final one here is around content abuse. So they may not even be a physical trend or a transaction happening, but in a lot of these two-sided marketplaces where people are posting different uh, pieces of content, think about spam, scams, misinformation. So pr prior to joining SIFT, I worked at Facebook and I led the, the spam ops team over there. And our primary goal was around keeping the ecosystem clean from various types of misinformation. Again, no, no um, kind of transaction happening on, on, the, on the platform, but there's many, many different kinds of scams and um, well, misinformation. Four years ago, it was about more political stuff. Present day, it's more about COVID stuff. Um, but that's also beginning to proliferate pretty darn widely. Um, so that's a snapshot of the fraud economy and kind of what it looks like. And then if I were to zoom forward a bit more, it's not just the only problem that a team faces. It comes also down to within an internal company, they also have to deal with silo teams. So a lot of fraud teams that you, you work with or you speak with, um, there's it, it often kind of, uh, it's a very disparate team. So there might be compliance, security, engineering, product management, legal, et cetera. And a lot of those teams may not communicate as often as they should. And fraud really thrives in these cracks in, in between these teams. And they're, the fraudsters or the, the, the hackers out there are counting on these teams not talking to each other. Um, and that's where a lot of fraud can proliferate as well. And the last point I'll bring up is around just general tool proliferation where these days, it, when I kind of shadow and do a lot of investigations into different accounts, it's astonishing how many different tools that a, a team has available. It's great that they have those tools available, 
But again, similar to these siloed teams, they're very disparate where they don't do a good job in general of talking to each other and therefore it makes it harder to connect the dots and, and therefore easier for fraud to proliferate. So I'll I guess stop sharing last... my screen at that moment, but go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say the last 12 months have really kind of uh, uh, made the key crucial difference then, haven't they? The remote teams and, and a different way of working for everyone. So that's, um, it, it's really put kind of fraud and, and safety online into the, the heart of what we're doing at the moment. Certainly at the forefront, in my opinion. And just because, I mean, obviously everybody was working from home, virtually everybody was working from home this past year. And a lot of fraud teams, they, it was a tougher transition for them just because they may not have had the same access to uh, the systems that predominantly were on premise. And those teams scaled back or had to scale back in terms of how effective they could be. And as a result, led kind of more, kind of invited more fraud into kind of the, uh, the, the, the city walls, if you will. And what are the main industries that you think are affected right now? Really, we're seeing it across the board, um, but when it comes to, rather than industry, I'll focus on types of businesses. So businesses that are specifically non-digital native that are have been forced over the past year to make that digital kind of divide jump. And as they kind of ramp up into this new space, it's great they're de- that they're doing it because they, they, they're doing it to survive, frankly, and they, they have, they've had to do that. But in terms of rushing so quickly to get something out the door, they've kind of left a lot of things kind of behind them that uh, it leaves them vulnerable. So case in point, uh, click and collect or uh, buy online, pick up and store as a function. A year or so ago, personally, as a consumer, I had never taken advantage of it, but now several apps, I, I do it, I enjoy it. But as a consumer, I look forward to that option. It's incredibly convenient, but from a, those, these are digital transactions and typically retailers or uh, companies have had days, if you will, to kind of vet that particular transaction. If it looks good, fine, ship it out there. But if it doesn't look good, you can pull it back. But now in this kind of digital world, these transactions are happening both online and off where someone, if it's a fraudster, they can click to buy something online and now the physical store only has a few hours to fulfill that particular transaction. And so those teams are put under the gun, if you will, in terms of being able to fulfill those transactions very quickly in, I mean, really to improve customer experience. And I frankly have never been asked for my ID when I picked up an item, I just showed up with a mask on, grab my stuff or have them put it in my car and drive away. Maybe I show them an email confirmation, but that's about it. And so, uh, again, from a convenience standpoint, I love it as a consumer, but from a fraud standpoint, it certainly opens up a lot of new new gaps. So there's certainly ways that can be taken advantage of in the, uh, the online world that we're all living in right now. And when it comes to the type of fraud rates or illicit order values, what sort of amounts are we talking about? So as far as industry standard, the it... I'd say it's around 50 basis points or 0.5% is like the typical uh, fraud rate that you're looking at. It does vary quite a bit across industry or or type. So if you're looking at straight digital goods, I'm thinking gift cards, digital currencies. I mean, for for your audience, I think it's more uh, financial focused. Those are instant, relatively instant transfers. Like we have a company that we work with right now that's focused on NFTs and it's very popular right now. Those are pretty fast in terms of delivery and fulfillment, the losses there are significantly higher or can be anyways, just because instant fulfillment, these are relatively new companies. So they're just trying to figure out their policies and procedures and um, have higher fraud rates as a result. The other area that I'll focus on would be, I mean, we talked about those non-digital native companies trying to make the jump. In general, those companies also have higher fraud rates when it comes to the online space just because they traditionally haven't had to, to deal with it. Uh, but now, um, it, I think in a good way, they're, they're making that change, but there are some, some growing pains that are associated with it. 
And what are the new schemes when it comes to fraud today? You mentioned, uh, you know, that the fraud can slip through the cracks, um, especially when teams are placed under pressure and having to deliver in faster times. But what are the sort of the new areas of fraud at the moment? Um, I think there's there's two that I'll I'd kind of raise. One is around account takeover. And so the amount of richness out there uh, for a particular account is tremendous now. It's not just about a single credit card on file. Maybe you can use it to, to make a transaction. There is a plethora of information that can be taken and then used on that site or taken to another site. Um, I guess case in point, I, something that we're beginning to see a little bit of it now, and I think it'll get worse, is um, we have a lot of companies in the travel and event space where over the last year, they've been relatively dormant. But now as travel begins to pick up, more and more people are logging into their travel accounts for the first time in a long time. Uh, maybe they got a new device by then, maybe they forgot their password, uh, but they're, they're, they're signing on again. Um, it actually just got a, a ping from a friend of mine yesterday where she logged into her airline mile account for the first time in a long time. And she realized that number one, a lot of her airline miles expired, which sucked. Number two, someone had gone in and drained her points um, and not re not redeem them for like airline um, like flights. You can redeem them for like gift cards or Bose headphones and things like that. And she ended up losing all those points. Now the the airline did end up uh, making her whole again in terms of uh, refilling those those miles, but uh, they said they could not do it to her old. Like she's had this account since 1999 and like memorize the account number and everything. And so they had to spin up a new account, new account number and put the points in there. So it just overall, just a really bad customer service experience for her, uh, but that's something that's popping up more. And then the other one I'd say is around synthetic identities being used where we're kind of a victim of our own success here in the sense of we've gotten pretty good at detecting the gibberish um, accounts out there that are just signing up with kind of random email addresses and just trying to purchase something, great. But in this kind of cat and mouse game, fraudsters have adapted as well, where they're starting to look at more legitimate information using that in their scripts. And so now it becomes harder and harder to tell if, hey, is this really Gina I'm talking to? Or is it some sort of synthetic identity that is being used in her place, use, being used to ex essentially extract value from my company? And what about the distinguishing factors from the last 12 months? You know, we're, we're talking to chatbots more often than we used to. We're not uh, having face-to-face -face interaction. What do you think is driving most of it? Um, in terms of the distinguishing factors, I mean, we've, we talked a little bit about the click and collect option, which is a new function that consumers get to enjoy now uh, or fraudsters get to enjoy as well. Um, the other one is there's just, a wave of new customers hitting the system where we essentially saw five years of growth in one year. Like it was just a huge growth spurt um, for many companies and many industries in e-commerce last year. Um, but that's been, again, as I mentioned, these growing pains where the to keep up with that demand and you have people, I'll say doing irregular things or non-standard things. So case in point, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, because all the restaurants were closed, we actually have a lot of um, alcohol merchants on the platform and we were seeing people buy like three handles of vodka. Like, wow, no one ever, why do you need to buy like three or four handles of vodka? Like you're not partying, like, but people are just hoarding alcohol or toilet paper or whatever. And these are legitimate transactions, but historically it was like, this is fraud. Like no one needs that much alcohol, uh, but during the pandemic, you know, I guess you do. Uh, and, and many of those were legitimate. And so that's one kind of, area. And the other one, or the last one I'll call out is around refund abuse. So many people were lost their jobs during the, the last, the past year, funds were certainly tighter. It became more enticing to do various types of refund abuse. So these are legitimate real people buying an item and then essentially taking advantage of or, or gaming the refund system where they would just go out and um, purchase it. And then uh, either falsely claim that they didn't receive the goods or kind of use the goods and then return them after a few days or whatever the time period was. You mentioned uh, click and collect, and I guess most of the transactions have been done via an app, maybe. Um, 
what does this uh, ability for fraud on the go lead us to? What's happening in that respect? In terms of fraud on the go, it's it, it's just the extension in general, like ultimately consumers benefit from this where the ease and convenience is going to win out. And so that's what most companies exist for, right? You want to be able to fulfill products for let's say the 99 plus percent of consumers that are hitting up your website. But we know also know that sub 1%, they're actively trying to do bad stuff on the platform. And sometimes the impact of that sub 1% can be disproportionately large in that way. And so really when it comes to the mobile space or getting into kind of that world, it's just another tool now that fraudsters will use to their advantage where they can just, Rather than go through a web browser, they can just download a, a, an app. Off they go. If they want to go, they click and collect route. They can search within, you know, 20 kilometers of their their residence, and, or hire someone to go within 20 kilometers of their residence, pick up those items, and then reship them to another location or pick it up themselves. And I guess as well as we've changed as consumers, then the technology to tech fraud has to change as well. Uh, and have there been any improvements in that at all? Yeah, the the great thing about our space, certainly the things that are in favor of fraudsters, I'll call it speed, scale, sophistication, and the surface area uh, of what they have to go after is certainly expanded. However, from a technology standpoint and from a speed scale sophistication standpoint, fraud teams or trust and safety teams our tool belt has also increased in size. Um, now I'd say there's some things that are working against us in terms of those siloed teams where we may not talk to all the right people within our own company. And I can guarantee you that fraudsters are collaborating every day on different forums and different marketplaces, it's buying, selling, and sharing best practices. You can buy those best practices actually, like people actively sell different ways to take advantage of company X, Y, or Z, um, and then go, go from there. And so I'd say the main things that are stepping up now is certainly reliance on machine learning as the primary defense against uh, these fraud vectors where fraudsters and, and criminals are deploying different scripts and technologies to really bust out, to look for those cracks and just essentially drive a truck through that particular vulnerability. And so now is even more important to rely on things like machine learning at the forefront to kind of protect um, your assets and your, your consumer base. Um, but it's not just ML for the sake of ML, it needs to be learning in real time. And so it's not about saying, hey, we'll have, we'll deploy machine learning and once a month or once a quarter, we'll suggest some rules for you to um, improve your systems. Like, no, no, that's, that's just a, a, a rules engine that's being kind of augmented by ML. We have to flip that over and use ML as the primary kind of purpose. Uh, and then rules have their, their place as well, but more of a backstop. And if you're a business worried about fraud or you know keeping um, consumers safe, how important is it to have a good partner when it comes to fighting fraud? Crucial. Um, in past experiences, like working at companies like Square or Facebook, my cross-functional partners were I could not survive or could not do my job well without them. And so I mentioned that it's a huge challenge now for these teams where they can often feel quite siloed and it's very difficult to succeed if that's the case, just because when it comes to accounts, either takeover or just new accounts taking advantage of the system, they're gonna pop up all around. Again, the fraudsters come at it from the standpoint, I don't wanna hit you directly, I'm going to look around all the edge cases and then kind of attack from the side from multiple angles. And because of that, you'll need to have really good communication with your security teams, customer support teams, even compliance teams to make sure that you are set up for success so that you can constantly evolve and make sure that you're staying one step ahead um, in terms of these new fraud vectors. I guess as a final question, what should businesses start to worry about when it comes to fraud and what initial tips would you give them? Um, right now, from a mindset perspective, 
I think we're too reactive. So often I hear about companies, they get hit with a fraud attack and they don't discover it themselves. Usually it's their customers that find it first or the credit card holder, or whoever finds it first. And then they escalate to the, usually the customer support team in some way, shape or form. And that's a tough position just to be in because you are so reactive at that point and you're just trying to put out fires and playing whack-a-mole. The best companies that I've seen work through this is they're essentially, they have a different mindset where they're approaching it from a more holistic standpoint where they need to understand the entire user journey to take action. And number two, they're really going about it in the sense of they are building products that are trust and safety by design. So to give you an example, um, let's say on, on Facebook, if you see a post that is not right for whatever reason, you now have the ability as a consumer to flag that piece of content and proactively mark it as bad. And yes, it's uh, like, if, if, if that happens, this, the machine learning models learn from even just a slight kind of uptick in that, and they can take action much more quickly. So instead of having, let's say a long delay between kind of the incident and then the response, begin to shorten that, that horizon to where it's only hopefully a few minutes or a few seconds in terms of being bad. And so therefore you limit the amount of, of badness that can happen out there. Um, and then the last one is in more of a, I'd say an optimistic or a growth mindset scenario is that most companies are out there, the way that they succeed is by growing, finding new customers, retaining existing customers. One kind of strategy that I've seen work out really well is for, and say the e-commerce world where businesses that can remove friction dynamically for really the 99 plus percent of users that are on your system that are good. And what can you do to improve the user experiences for, for these, the vast, vast majority out there. And the example I give is typically like, we are, we're used to locking our cars or our front doors. And that's, that's just a reflex we do. We do it for security purposes, right? Like nobody, I'd say likes to lock their car door just for, for fun, but we do it because we don't want our stuff being broken into. And now technology is caught up in the sense of, okay, you have like keyless entry. You can, you know, you can detect through Bluetooth, et cetera, that you're nearby. And so technology has made it invisible in the sense of like, my car is locked, it is safe, but it doesn't impede me. I don't have to pull out my keys and like lock the car anymore. And from a technology standpoint in the e-commerce world, in the FinTech world, we're also seeing more of that now where the app or the system knows me and I don't have to jump through those hoops, whether it's 2FA or the most common one in the States is probably um, you enter in that the CVV code on the back of your credit card, that three digit number. So assuming you're not going through 3DS, you have to put in that, that code and it's done solely for security purposes. No product team was like, yeah, I'd love to have that feature in my checkout flow. And the companies that are really good at detecting fraud and abuse. If this is looking like a legitimate user or transaction, they're actually removing that in the flow now. And so like, wow, for 99% of transactions, what if we could remove that functionality of having to put in your CVV code? Well, that's fantastic. That's gonna to lead to higher conversions and more growth. And so those are things that the risk team can do and can supply with the right tool set. It sounds like things are changing at, at quite a fast pace then at the moment and mainly driven by machine learning as well. Yeah, that's what keeps the industry exciting. And uh, I'd say it's a large market out there though, right? And so from a, there are certainly innovators out there that are really high on that maturity curve, but then you have your, I'd say the, the bulk of the population is now moving in that direction, but you're always going to have those laggards out there that are kind of the slower adopters. Oftentimes they might be more traditional banks or uh, brick and mortar retailers that are just now kind of making that 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 jump into online. Well, thank you very much for joining me, Kevin. That's been uh, really good advice and, and lovely to listen to. So thank you very much for that. Of course. Thank you so much. And just to uh, say once again, the SIFT 2021 Trust and Safety Index exposing the multi-billion dollar fraud economy is now available to download.